So as we pick up now, I should have put verse numbers on here. What, what verse is this? These are the records of the generations of Noah. Uh, so this is starting this next section here, and it's going to be the flood narrative. Um, and notice how it starts off. Noah was what? A righteous man. Okay, that is the first time, I believe, I'm pretty sure, that's the first time of the word righteous, you know, used in the Bible. And actually, that's one of the principles that we see. Often the very first time a word is used, it defines that word. And so we're going to really see that what this word righteous means as we kind of walk through this section. Now, there's going to be some other key terms that are introduced. So we'll just kind of see them as we come along. Okay, notice this idea. He was what? Blameless in his time and what? Noah walked with God. So you can see all three of those terms kind of right there are significant. No, that ties us back to Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And even goes all the way back to the garden, right? Adam and Eve walked with God. God walked with them in the cool of the day, right? So that once again speaks of relationship. But now we have this idea of righteous. Okay, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence. He looked, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way. And then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence, you know, because of them. Behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Okay. So God is now, and this is a principle that we're going to see later in Genesis as well. God's bringing Noah into his plan. It's the same thing that God does with Abraham later. Um, so you could see God's going to use Noah as the one through whom he's going to save the world. Um, and that's, once again, this is this important concept. It's not just for it's not just about the story, but it's teaching us as well as we're going to see. So um, anyway, G God's bringing Noah into his plan. He's like, you know, and he gives him these instructions, right? Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, cover it with rooms, pitch. This is how you should make it. Length in the ark, the breadth, the width. There's a window, there's a door, all these decks, first, second, third decks. You know, I'm bringing, I'm going to destroy all earth. And then here's the key concept, okay? But what? I will establish, here's the key word, my covenant with you, okay? Now, this is important. I want you to understand this, um, and we'll see how this plays out. This is the, once again, this is the first time the word covenant is used in the Bible, and it's going to be, God's going to really define what is a covenant here, right? And now, it was a word, they had covenants, right? So you could translate this even like a contract, you know, like they had business contracts, they had agreements, they had, so it's not like the word wasn't used in Hebrew in, in ancient times. There was lots of contracts back then, just, just like there is today. Uh, but God is really going to kind of show us what this means and how it's part of his plan and his purpose. Okay, so now you get down to the end of it and notice what it says. He, God's giving Noah all these instructions and then what? Notice the very end. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Okay? So here's, so notice how it started. Noah was righteous, right? Then we have this, righteous is a very covenantal word. Okay, I'm going to explain that in just a minute. Then you have this covenant, and then you see at the end, Noah what? Did according to everything that God commanded him, so he did. And basically, let me just kind of summarize what's, what's going on here. What is a covenant? You know, it's an agreement. Now, we're going to see through the Bible that there's two basic kinds of covenant. There's bilateral or parties with two covenants, and there's unilateral covenants with one party. Okay? But this is what we'd call a bilateral covenant. Right? God's making this agreement with Noah. Right? And, and what, what is the basis? So, someone <laughs> tell me, like, what do you think is the, just summarize, what's the basic idea of this covenant here? You're not going to die. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to die. I'll save you if you do what I say. You build the boat. You do it right. I mean, listen, just put yourself, <laughs> you're, you're building the boat. The whole world's going to be flooded. I think you'll want to follow the instructions. You with me? Right? Like you build that boat wrong. It's tipping. You're drowning. Right? You with me? Right? I mean, so like it's very important that Noah follows the instructions very carefully because if he doesn't, that boat's not going to float, right? So that, that's kind of the nature of this. Like, okay, Noah, you, th th there's part of it that's on him, right? Like if you follow me, I'm going to, obviously God's not giving him that's something that's impossible for him, but he's like, you need to follow, you need to, and that's the whole idea, right? He was righteous 
And, that, and righteous is a very, as I said, covenantal word. Like we think of righteousness, we definitely go to Paul and like this idea of imputed righteousness and things, which obviously the word, you know, has, that's later and that's important. But he, in the Old Testament, the idea of righteousness, you could almost just translate, like it has a lot to do with covenant faithfulness. And it has to do with like right relationship. Okay, you with me? So it, it's like, to be righteous is like, you're not going to, you're not deceptive. You're not, you're, you're keeping your end of the bargain. You're honest. You have integrity. That's a big part of what righteousness means in the Old Testament. And so here, like Noah is righteous. Like he kept his end of the bargain. He had integrity. He followed through. You with me? That's, that's the kind of flavor that the word has. And actually later, I mean, obviously the Old Testament is so huge. I mean, and the word righteous is all over it. It definitely has this, um, like righteous has this idea of being in right relationship, like even with one another, like, you know, for a community to function, especially like the nation of Israel, you know, there's kind of like got to be some uh, agreements. There has to be some norms. There has to be some, like you have to follow the rules or else it doesn't work, right? So righteousness definitely comes that flavor as well. Um, Anyway, it gets into justice. I'm not going to go into all of that right? But here it's very covenantal. And this part of it, you could see like, there's this covenant, you're going to enter the ark and it's implied like, I'll save you, right? If you walk with me, you obey me, you follow my instructions. Okay. Now I hope you can understand and just see just from that quick overview of like what a covenant is, how applicable this is to Israel, right? The second generation, right? It's, It's all about, hey, keep my covenant walk with me, you know, and I'll bless you and I'll accomplish my plan through you. And so it was just as important for the nation of Israel to walk with God, to keep his covenant, to walk righteously with him so that God would use them to save the world just the same way that Noah had to walk righteously for God to save the world through him. So you could see here this idea that like God wants to save the world. He's using us to do it. And that's going to be the same thing with Abraham. It's it obviously goes all the way even into the New Testament, right? Like we are, as we're in right relationship with God, God spreads the gospel through us and saves the world ultimately, right? So you could see God's plan is his hardest for the world and he wants to use us, okay? Does that, does that make sense? You track in with just like this idea of what is a covenant. And here, once again, we're going to get into the unilateral covenant. A unilateral co- covenant is just like an unconditional promise, And we're going to get into that. That's very important. But in its most basic form, God is promising to do something if you'll do something. And that's, that's what we're seeing here, right? This real, it's relational, right? It's very relational. Any any questions about that? Notice once again, you could see here the purpose of it, right? To what? To keep them alive, right? It's, it's, it's salvation. It's preservation. It's, I mean, of the whole world, not just of humanity, but also the birds and the animals as well. Okay, any, any questions? Do you, do you see the basic gist of what's happening here? So while there is judgment, the flood is judgment for sure, there's also salvation, right? And they go hand in hand, but the salvation is through this covenant. And so theologically, that's very important here. Like salvation is through covenant. And that's what we're going to get to. We're, we're really moving the, Noah, the, the Noahic covenant here. It's important, but it doesn't really get referenced in the rest of the Bible, right? It's not like the means of, it was the means that God saved the world from the flood, but it's really a picture of the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, which is going to be the big storyline of scripture as we're going to see. Like those, if you really want to understand the storyline of the Bible, you have to understand covenants. Yeah. Is it referenced a little though with the water being a judgment and then the future? Absolutely. Yes, it is for sure. And you see the same thing in first Peter, like God saved the world through Noah, through the ark. And, and it's obviously referenced as like this picture of salvation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's in terms of just like, especially in the old Testament, like the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenants, the ones that keep getting referenced to like God's, like, in other words, the God's plan to save the world by the flood that's done. It's not ongoing, right? It's like God saved the world. There's no more flood. It's done. But God's plan to save the world, period, is not done, right? That, and that is the Abrahamic covenant. It's God's plan to save the world. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that next week. We'll, we'll maybe preview it this week if we get there. Yeah. Yeah, so would this covenant be considered bilateral? Yes. 
Yeah, because it's, it's definitely, right? You see the emphasis, like Noah did according to all that God commanded him. Like it's on him. If Noah didn't follow the directions carefully, this plan wouldn't have worked, right? And so that's kind of the, the I mean, it's like, wow. I mean, you know, it's easy, once again, with God's thought, God is going to save the world. That's his plan, right? He's not going to fail, right? It's not like, oops, I made the world and it, it's lost and oh man, I, I messed up. Like God's going to save the world. We know that. We know the end of the story. We know the book of Revelation. It's going to result in God saving a new creation to himself and the whole world worship. So we, we know the plan's going to work, but the, the, I think maybe because we know the end of the story, it's easy to think, well, it doesn't matter about us. But this story is like, no, like you're part of the plan. You have to walk with me or else this plan isn't going to work. And God's going to make it work because he's going to change our hearts and that gets into the new covenant. And that's even in the Torah as well. But there is an aspect where if we don't keep our side of the covenant, people won't be saved, right? And so it really shows us the importance of walking with God and keeping covenant and being in relationship with him. Like it's pretty amazing. God put the whole fate of the human race on Noah's ability to follow his commands, right? I mean, that's, that's shocking, isn't it? Right. But, but he said it worked, right? He saved the world. And, and I, once again, it's easy for us to minimize our role. Like obviously we're not saving, but that's the same idea for us, right? God puts the destiny of unbelievers in that sense on us as believers, following his commands, walking with him, living out our identity. I mean, it's, that's the nature of covenant. And that it was true, just as true in the old covenant as it is in the new. You know, I love the fact that he uh, points out what type of a man he is. Exactly. I mean, because you're not, you know, he gives us someone to imitate. Yeah. Yep. Blameless. Yeah. He's righteous. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the, the crux of, you know, who he is and who we should be. Right? Yeah, exactly. And we know it's by faith, to your point earlier, but that faith resulted in him being very careful to do everything that God said. And that's actually, as we're going to see throughout the whole Torah, that's really what faith looks like. It looks like you care what God says and you follow through with it, right? How could you, if, if, we all know this, right? Like if you say God is God and I trust him and you're like, he says something and you don't do it, what kind of faith is that, right? Like, Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're gonna, that's, that's what we're seeing here, right? Um, but it's got to be this obedience that flows out of faith. That's good. All right. So now we go to chapter 7. So anyway, Noah, you know, God says to Noah, enter into the household for you alone. And then once again, it, Moses makes sure that what? We get the point. You alone are righteous before me in this time. Now this, once again, this isn't self-righteousness. This isn't works righteousness. Once again, that's why I'm emphasizing this word righteousness has to do with relationship, faithfulness in relationship, right? Um, and once again, this, this term, um, actually, I was just talking about, Justin and I were just talking about this uh, with Roger yesterday. We were talking about, you know, even in Deuteronomy, this is going to be defined. It's, it's not works righteousness, but it's righteousness through relationship. It's righteousness through trusting God. It's, it's always by faith, and we see this aspect here. Anyway, so you know what happens. I, I don't need to go through, but to notice the repetition, right? According to all that Yahweh commanded him, Noah did right? Noah, that's what it means that he's righteous. He, he listens to God. He does what God says, right? Um, and, and then in here, we're starting to get some of this language of the flood. I will blot out from the face of the earth every living thing that I have made, okay? Um, and so then, then the flood, I'm trying to see, obviously he brings in all the animals. It, the purpose is obviously to keep offspring alive, so salvation, preservation, okay? But then, you know, we start getting here. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth, okay? Uh, Noah and his sons, they entered the ark, the clean animals. It, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into it too much here, but there's the seven of the clean. And, and then once again, in the 600th year of Noah's life, seventh month, the fountains of the great deep burst open. The floodgates of the sky were open. Rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, all the wives, everything comes in. Uh, they went two by two. All right. And, and God closed the door. Okay. And now in this next section here, there's one word that gets, I mean, there's a couple of words that keep getting repeated. 
But for 40 days, the water is increasing. And here's, here's the word I want you to notice. The water prevailed. The water prevailed. The water prevailed. Okay, that word, and then blotted out is the other kind of key word here. Um, but the word prevailed, it, it's, go, remember back when it's like the mighty men of the earth? That's this word. It's really like God triumphed. He conquered. He strong. I mean, this is very, once again, it's, the story is not like, oh, there's this nice little flood. It's, it's like God is a warrior. That's the picture here. God's a warrior and he conquered the earth, you know? So it's, it's heavy. It's, it's a weighty, like it's not, I mean, it is a children's story, but it's not the children's story that you would think of, right? Um, like, so that, that the water prevailed, the water prevailed, the water prevailed. It's just going higher. And, 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 and obviously, I mean, just everything is dying. You know, every living thing on the earth perished and um, everything that has the breath of the spirit of life died. And, you know, um, he blotted out every living thing. So, you know, and then once again, how does it end? The water, what? Prevailed. And there it is. So God won, right? You, can, you can't, you know, God's going to win. He, when he brings judgment on the earth, it's going to happen. Okay, so that's that that whole you know when the flood actually happens, that's the emphasis emphasis in that section. Um, and then oh, you see blotted out again, you know. So we see you know um, blotted out, prevailed, died, perished. I mean, that's the language that's being emphasized here in this flood narrative. Um, every living thing, every swarming thing. Okay, but let's get to the good part. And here's the key word here but God remembered Noah. Now that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Right? Um, wh- why is that interesting? Because God, God never forgets. Okay? So, but this word remembered is a very, once again, covenantal language. Right? Because, because once again, now, I mean, if you're husband or wife, you know this, right? How often do we like, oh yeah, I'll do this. And then what do we do? Forget. Right? It's like you, you make a commitment right? So that's the idea of a covenant, right? Is like you make a commitment, but then you got to follow through. You got to remember. And so to, to DC's point, God never forgets. And so the fact that he remembers here is emphasizing something, right? That what is it emphasizing? God's going to keep his end of the bargain, right? Because remember now Noah, like the, there's flood on, you know, God just conquered the earth. And, and what was the promise? Hey, if you do everything according to what I say, I'll what? I'll save you. Moses, I mean, Moses, Noah did what? He did everything according to what God said. He followed through. He was righteous. You know, he trusted God and he, he cared about God's word and he followed through carefully. And so now the question is what? Is God going to come through with his side of the bargain? And we, of course, know he will, right? That's what, but that's what's being emphasized here. This is kind of like, oh, the waters prevailed. Okay, now what? The whole earth is flooded. Everything has died oh, God remembers, right? And so then God causes this wind and it's not like he's just gonna be stuck up there forever and die in the boat, right? It's like, no, God's gonna remember him. And then the whole rest of this is about the water receding and, and whatnot. But it's interesting, um, there's this whole thing, he sends out the bird, he sends out the raven. And I would say what's emphasized in chapter eight here is this aspect of waiting, right? Like God remembered, but Noah still has to wait, doesn't he? He has, to, he has to like depend upon God. Like God doesn't just, I mean, the water doesn't, obviously the whole earth just got flooded. The water doesn't just instantly go away. It's, he tells it how long, it's like half a year, right? I mean, it's, it's many months that the water's receding and all that time, just to picture yourself as Noah, you're stuck in this boat. You're like, what's going on out there? You know, and like, it's really testing, like your trust in God. He's waiting on God. And that's, once again, just covenantally, that's what's being emphasized. Like, God made this promise. Am I going to trust him? I mean, am I going to wait on him? Like, you know, he, and that's obviously, we can see the application for us, right? God's made us promises. Do we trust him? Do we wait on him? Like, salvation doesn't always come immediately, but God will be faithful. He remembers. He never forgets. He never, you know, lets, uh, lets us down with his end of the bargain. You see, you see the emphasis there. So I, I'm not going to go through. There. I would, I do want to hit, um, you know, some of the later chapters here. So I'm, you know, just this idea like he's waiting. 
another seven days. I can't remember like several times in here. It's just like how much time, how much time, how much waiting, right? He waited yet another seven days and he's waiting, he's waiting, you know? Um, and it talks about how long he's waiting. Um, all right, so now getting coming on to this part of chapter eight. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons, your son wives, bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh, birds, animals, every creeping thing. And then once again, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What does that remind us of? Beginning. And so we could see here that this is kind of a, it's a new beginning, isn't it? It's, it's a starting afresh. Like, okay, God wiped out all the, the demon DNA. He wiped out all the wickedness. Now all you have is Noah and his sons and his son's daughters. So everything's going to be good, right? And we know it's not, right? And that's kind of the story is that it's still going to keep spiraling down, right? Uh, because once again, just the effects of sin and death right? We're, like we need a bigger solution. And obviously we know where this story is ultimately going. It's ultimately going to the cross. It's ultimately going to the new covenant. It's ultimately going to like, we need completely transformed hearts. Like our problem is too deep to, to solve just by like starting, I, you know, like a fresh start. That's all I need. If I could just go start fresh, you know, like, no, the problem is deeper than that. It runs right through the middle of my heart, right? So we need the spirit. We need God. Ultimately, we need the new covenant. We need Christ. Um, so once again, he's not getting into all that here, but that's what this story is showing. It's showing that, man, sin runs deep. <laughs> you know, it's death runs deep. It's, it's built into our, our, our DNA, so to speak. Um, then it kind of ends, right? Noah built an altar to the Lord and he, the Lord smells the smoothing, you know, the soothing aroma. He says, I will never again curse the ground for the intent of his man's heart. So this is once again, <laughs> this statement gets repeated, evil from his youth, the intent. What, what's that emphasizing? It's still there, right? Um, and he's like, I'm not going to do this again because th- this is, this is kind of who you are. Right. So um, I just have to keep wiping out the earth, <laughs> you know, like that's almost what he's emphasizing here. And so you could you could see the the emphasis, right, is just the corruption of sin and death. And that's for this story to end well. That's what's got to be dealt with. Right. Does that make sense? Like that's the problem. And, you know, with any worldview, you you have to know what the problem is to have the right solution. Right. You know, the, our world, what would they identify as the problem? like bad circumstances or this or that, right? And so you just got to change your circumstances. You got to do this. But the, the Bible tells us what the problem is, right? It's our hearts, the evil in our hearts, the death, the selfishness, the pride, right? It's been, it's been analyzing kind of the DNA of temptation and sin, right? Does that make sense? And so we, we, as this story is unfolding, we see the problem. And so that also is, you know, hinting at what the solution has to be. It's got to be deep. It's got to be complete heart transformation, right? Um, it hasn't said that yet, but that's where we're going. And even in Deuteronomy, that's where it's going to go. Okay? Is this still part of the covenant you made? Yeah, so, I mean, that, yeah, we're gonna, it's going to talk about that in chapter 9 more. But, yeah, it's like while earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. So there's going to be an, an kind of a new covenant here with Noah. So let's, let's look at that. All right, so once again, kind of this new new beginning, Noah what? He blesses, God blesses Noah and his sons. And once again, be fruitful and multiply, fill all the earth. So when it's repeated. When it's repeated, you know it's important. There's an emphasis there. There's new creation, new start. Um, the, the terror and the fear of every beast is on you. Um, it's going to be food for you. But so this is, you know... Um, I'm trying to, yeah, I think this is, you know, eating meat, obviously, you know, like God's, you know, obviously that's good and he's requiring, uh, but here's this new aspect, right? Surely I will require your love, um, sorry, I'm trying to, okay, whoever sheds man's blood by his blood, man shall be shed for in the image of God, he made man. Right, but as for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth, and then notice this. Now, behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you. Okay, so this is with every living creature, the birds, cattle. Um, I will establish my covenant again with you, 
So you could see how it's just co emphasizing covenant all throughout this section, you know, and I will never again cut off the water of the flood, you know, neither shall there ever be in a flood to destroy the earth. So this is, uh, an un this is a unilateral covenant. God's like, I'm never going to do this again. I'm giving you this covenant. And then what does he do? This is the sign of the covenant. And he puts, right, a bow in the clouds. Now, what kind of bow is this? We call it a rainbow, but it's, it's just a bow. So it's really like God, like taking his war bow and sticking it in the clouds as a reminder, like, because once again, what was the emphasis in the flood? I conquered you. I shot you. I destroyed you. And so he puts up his bow as a reminder okay, I'm putting my weapon down, you know, like I'm not going to just come and do this with the flood anymore. And now we, we know, of course, ultimately the end of the story, God is going to come back, but not by flood, right? And so this is this covenant that God makes um, to never destroy the world by flood again. And just, you could say in that sense, where he says, you know, springtime and harvest, like then, you know, like there's never going to be this cataclysmic world event until the end, uh, and that's, that's what we've seen in world history. There hasn't been, you know, this asteroid that's come next and this and this and next. Like the world flood, that was like this global catastrophe. And since then, there's been lots of local catastrophes, but no global ones. Um, so once again, God is going to keep this covenant and keeps emphasizing the sign of the covenant. So really what this is doing is it's, it's establishing for us, like, you know, defining the terms, helping us to understand what is a covenant, right? We got this bilateral covenant through which God saved the world through Noah as Noah obeyed. But then there's also this unilateral covenant where God's like, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. I promise I'm going to put my sign. And obviously that sign of the covenant is the rainbow. But then as we get in, what's going to be the sign of the Mosaic covenant? Circumcision, right? And so this kind of these reminders that God's building into the world of what? His faithfulness. He's going to keep his end of the deal. He's going to be faithful. Isn't the sign of the Mosaic covenant the Sabbath? Yeah, I mean, I guess probably both. Yeah, I mean, you. I mean, he definitely talks about circumcision as the sign, but yeah, I, I think that I'd have to rem, rem, be reminded, like the language of sign. Yeah, I, 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 I would, I believe you there that it could refer to the Sabbath. I don't remember that language, but it's probably there. Yeah, good. All right. So anyway, just how many times, like my covenant, <laughs> my covenant, the sign. Um, all right. Um, and then we got this story, right, of Noah. So that, that's kind of the flood narrative. That, that ends the flood narrative. And once again, that flood narrative is emphasizing covenant. It's emphasizing God's faithfulness. And it's emphasizing the importance of us being faithful to God. It emphasizes, I would even go so far as to say, like, God saves the world through covenant, right? Through He wants to work through people. And that's, once again, this amazing truth. Okay, so... Now, as the story continues on, Noah begins farming, he plants a vineyard, and he drinks the wine and becomes drunk, and he's naked in his tent. And then you see Ham, and then notice what's emphasized here. Ham is what? The father of Canaan, right? Saw the nakedness of his father. And Shem and Japheth, the other two sons, they take a garment, they go backwards, and they cover their father's nakedness, right? So they didn't see it. But when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done, and he says what? Now notice this, he says, cursed be Canaan. Um, he doesn't curse Ham, he curses Canaan. And this, obviously, where, does this, where is this going? Well, the Canaanites, right? So we're, we're getting an understanding here, like in God's, like it's not coincidence, I guess you could say, that the Canaanites were wicked and enemies of God. Like it's part of uh, the sins of the father transferring to the sins of the sons. I mean, uh, it's not to say that they weren't responsible for their sin, but we're, it's kind of showing where this is coming from. And ultimately, uh, we're so much of the story, obviously, the Canaanites are these enemies of God once again. And, and uh, man, we're gonna, in Genesis later, we're going to see the time of the Canaanites is not yet full. And God gives them 400 years after Abraham. So, I mean, even far after this, like God is going to be real patient with them, but they are going to be in that sense, just like the wickedness pre-flood, just this sin run amok. And, and, you know, in, in that sense, it's coming out of their father, Ham, and just his sin and, and just how that's being passed down through the generations. Um, but then of course, God, so 
blessing and cursing obviously is this repeated theme throughout the Old Covenant. And so the contrast to that is, of course, um, blessed be the Lord, he said, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So Shem gets blessed, Canaan gets cursed. Shem, like all the Semitic peoples are going to come out of Shem. And, you know, Canaan at Ham, that's going to end up being Africa, and Japheth is going to end up being the rest of the world. And just kind of like these three-part division of you know, the world into these three parts. We're going to get that in chapter 10. Um, May God enlarge Japheth and him dwell in the tents of Shem. And I guess you could say this. Throughout Genesis, you get these kind of prophetic blessings. And what it's emphasizing in that sense is God's control and sovereignty and his plan that's going to be worked out. Kind of as we see prophecy, there's very much this focus on the future. Like, it's very similar here, what we're seeing, to the end of Genesis when Jacob blesses his 12 sons, and he blesses them prophetically. He, like, it's, it's kind of like this. He sees who they are, and yet he prophesies, like, what that's going to become into the future. And that's, that's basically what's going on here. And I guess I'll just say with that that the emphasis in Genesis is on the future. It's about God's plan being worked out and, and, the, and the, the details of how that plan is going to be worked out. And even kind of this chosen line and this rejected line, this blessing and this curse, right? We're going to see this all throughout the story. Shem is chosen, Ham is not. Jacob is chosen, Esau is not. You know, Isaac is chosen, Ishmael is not. I mean, you just, you see that chosen, rejected, the blessed and the curse, so to speak. I mean, you get this opposition, right? That's part of you, we would just say God's election is part of his grace where he's choosing people to use and to work through and, and even to transform. We're going to get into all that throughout the rest of Genesis, you know, to be part of his plan. But the people God chooses, he also, they have to be faithful to him. And he also has to transform and humble so that they'll actually walk with him. So we'll, we'll, that's, that's a little bit of a preview, right? But I'm just emphasizing these are major themes in Genesis and the rest of the Torah, blessing and cursing, God's choosing, God's, you know, election, God's grace, God's like, you know, once again, Abraham, he's going to use, call one man to be part of his plan to save the world. And he's going to bless the world through him. It's, it's this idea of God working through people, you know, but it's not through all people. And it's, it's kind of this, I mean, there's an, there's kind of a dual aspect here of, you know, we all know this about election. There's God's election where like he chooses someone, he's going to work through them, but that doesn't mean that they're not responding by faith and they're not actually walking faithfully to him and trusting him. And so, you know, it, I guess I'll just say there's a huge emphasis on Genesis that about God's plan and his unilateral prom, like he's going to bless the world. This is his plan that's being worked out. But once again, we have this unique part to play in it. And we want to be like Noah. We want to be like Enoch. We want to walk with God. We want to trust him. We want to be part of his covenant so we could be part of the plan. Uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll detail that a little bit more at the end. Okay, I know that's a lot. Yeah, Nathan. What is the word he capitalized? So cursed be Cain and servant, servant, he. Oh, so that's because this is poetic. And um, if you were to look in like a printed Bible, that he would be on the next line. And so in poetry, you know, it's formatted a little bit differently. And my Bible program here isn't formatting it like that because I wanted to fit more on the page. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a, an oddity of formatting. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Some translations will capitalize pronouns when they're referring to God, but that's not what this is doing here. This is here just because in a printed Bible of the NASB, this he would be, you'll, you'll see um, if you open your printed Bibles, like different sections will be like inset as like, it's like, cause it's poetic, it's poetry or something like that. And so that, that's what this is referring to. Yeah. Good question. All right. And then Noah died. And <laughs> just like the rest of them. Okay, any any questions? Yeah. Why did Noah die if he walked with God? Yeah, so that's a, I mean, that's a great question. Um, ultimately, not all of God's servants get to get transported to heaven. Actually, there's only two in the whole of Bible that don't die. It's Enoch and Elijah, right? Are the only two in the whole of Scripture that don't die. 
And I actually think that they're going to be the two prophets that come in Revelation because they're the only two guys that haven't died. Um, anyway, I, that's a whole other story. Um, but, um, you know, they're, they're in, they just got transported directly to heaven. And so you got one prophet from before the flood and one after that going to come and preach. I, I don't know. That's a little speculative. But um, in any case, um, yeah, I mean, just like most of God's servants throughout time, they walk with God. And the lesson is, we ultimately, we have eternal life, right? So the principle is we escape death by walking with God, but that doesn't mean, you know, God's servants don't have to die ever, like any of us, right? So um, most of God's servants actually do die. Um, but Enoch was an exception to that to kind of show us this principle of like, man, you there is a way to escape death. There is, you know, through relationship with God, we can have eternal life. Yeah. And I mean, I'm just thinking, I'm not trying to answer it any, I'm just thinking through your question. And it's like, we can't inherit the kingdom of God until we take off the perishable. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. I, I'm just, mm-hmm. That's how I look. Mm-hmm. Important that it's like, okay, I have to do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Because we know, ultimately, we have the hope of the resurrection and eternal life. Yeah, good. I know, I, I noticed too, like, you know, uh, I, I've been hearing that, but I never see it that way because... You know, Noah was naked, na- naked in yep. shame, and then they had they had to cover that. Yes, that's a good light, point. The same like uh, the beginning, like um, yeah, and then and Eve. The, 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 I'm glad you. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that out. Absolutely, there's an emphasis here, right? Just like sin and shame, right? And you know, wanting like sin, like yeah, the. Ham obviously didn't cover it. He exposed it. He told his brothers about it. He laughed about it, you know, that kind of thing, as opposed to like, man, God's desire to cover sin and to, you know, cover our shame. So there's no doubt there's a tie there to Genesis 3. Absolutely. That's a good observation. I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. I am going to ask a question, but you don't have to answer it. Is this like how, like, where do dinosaurs? Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So Yeah, I would, like, so obviously dinosaurs were real. You know, we know that they were created. Um, So I believe that, yeah, before the flood, they were everywhere, you know, like, and and most, I would suggest all the dinosaur fossils that we find are because of the flood, right? They they all died. Now, I think there probably were baby dinosaurs on the ark, you know, but after the flood, and this is, you know, this gets into like creation science, so that this doesn't, you know, isn't, you know, explicitly in the Bible, but uh, many create, like, even in the text, we saw God open the floodgates of the heavens and the depths. So I believe there was like an app, you know, a change in the atmosphere after the flood. Well, we know as well, right? Before the flood, like people were living a thousand years. After the flood, they weren't, right? There, I, I think there was a, a big change in just the earth at, through the flood, you know, like people have said, like, okay, it was like prior, prior to the flood, there's like kind of a greenhouse effect. And, you know, so, I mean, whatever it is, we know humans after the flood, we went from living a thousand years to a hundred and dinosaurs I started to die. Out. Well, mostly died off. And I would say, and once again, this in high school, I was really into this and early college, like love researching this stuff. I do think that there were dinosaurs after the flood, but just not as many. Um, and so they, they didn't thrive after the flood. So I think there are even ancient accounts of dinosaurs in China, all, all over the world, like living dinosaurs, even like uh, cave drawings of dinosaurs and different stories. Um, but because of the change in atmosphere, they most of them died in the flood. And, and I mean, just think about it, you know, like you, you see you know, like the Jurassic Park or whatever, like all, I mean, these huge dinosaurs, the amount of food and vegetation that they would need to eat to survive, that just wasn't there after the flood. Everything got wiped out, right? So it was just much harder for dinosaurs to live after the flood. And so there was very few of them. They didn't thrive. That's, that's the gist of it. But obviously there's a lot of creation scientists that do a lot of research. It could tell you a lot more than that, but that's, that's just like a simple framework, yeah. And then, um, I saw some history, too, like, they found, like, the skeleton for giants, too. I don't know if it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks real. Too. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know that, it's, yeah, that human, you mean, uh, human skeleton. Yeah, human skeleton, yeah. 
All right, yeah, Anthony. There's one more question. Um, do most biblical scholars believe that the flood was local or global? Well, I don't know about most. Um, you know, I think the textual account is clear that it was global, right? So, I mean, there are obviously those who say it was local, but I don't feel like that's um, giving sufficient weight to Scripture. You know, I think that that's really coming from just presuppositions that are anti-scriptural ultimately. You know, I don't think it's heresy, but I do think it undermines, like if you just go by the textual account and let that be your authority, I, I think you really would come to a global, I mean, he says everything on the earth was wiped out and, and on and on. So, I mean, people, people ask, I mean, that raises all kinds of questions, right? And it raises questions like, wait a minute, how much water there have to be for like, you know, the highest mountain on earth to be covered? Well, you have to remember, like, I think a lot of those mountains were formed in the flood, right? So prior to the flood, mountains weren't necessarily that high, you know, like there's this, the flood was really this global upheaval of earthquakes and tectonics. So really, I would say, you know, prior to the flood, it, the world didn't even, the mountains weren't as high. It it wasn't the same. So, because otherwise it's, you know, anyway, there's a lot of questions there that you have to, we don't have all the answers to, but there are biblical scientists that, devote their lives to thinking through those kind of questions, you know, and I think there's good answers to them um, that I would say, you know, it kind of brings up this question of kind of like faith and reason, right, or faith and science, you know, like ultimately uh, my conviction, right, is that the word of God is authoritative. It's, you know, like it's our final authority and like we have to believe in that regardless, but that I don't think the Bible is anti-science, right? Just like you know, I mean, we've talked about archaeology before. I think, man, the more good archaeology you do, you find, man, pretty much, I mean, we could just, we could have a whole class just on biblical archaeology and how many finds there have been that validate the Bible happened just as it said. And we could, I could list off examples off the top of my head. We could do a whole class on that. You know, I'd say the same thing with science. You know, good science, I think, does validate the Bible, but it raises the question. The big question is like, when when unbelievers do science, they are coming from it with an anti-supernatural presupposition, right? So when you do science, you do experiments and you, um, you know, you look at results. And inherently, if you get something that seems impossible, that it's impossible, you're like, oh, something was wrong, right? Because that's your assumption, like th- th- it's impossible. And then the other thing is science always has to do with repeatable you know, science, right? But we're talking about the past and the past cannot be repeated. And so while it's true that good science, you know, should validate the Bible, when you're talking about things that happened in the past, you, 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 there's just a lot that you can't know. And there's a lot that um, we don't know what the situations were then, right? So we could say things like, well, it's, there's not enough water in the whole earth to cover, but, you know, the highest mountain on earth, but we don't know that the, the, the mountains now is the way they were then, right? So there's just all kinds of assumptions because we don't know the past. And that's why ultimately we have to trust in the word of God. So, I mean, it does raise a lot of hard questions to wrestle through. And I'm not saying there are no hard questions. And I'm not saying, I mean, I probably, I mean, just st- teaching in an academic setting and, you know, like, I would say I've wrestled through a lot of questions. I still have a lot of hard questions that I don't know the answer to. But there, but I also say there's a lot of hard questions that really used to challenge my faith that now I do have answers to, if that makes sense, right? So, so I don't have the answers to everything. I can't answer every science, but I think the more I study, the more I study the word of God and, and even science, the more I see that there actually is validity to the word of God and we should take it literally and seriously and like really trust what it says. So, I mean, that's, that's a huge, you know, once again, we could have a whole class on faith and science and yeah. But there also hasn't been any legitimate science that's disproved any of it. Right, right, right. And that's where, you know, you have to get into like when scientists say this is this many years old, and we've proven this scientifically. Well, how? And that gets into carbon dating. I love, that's a fun topic. I love talking about that. You know, I love, because, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know as well, like radioisotopes, how that stuff works. Some of that is legitimate, but some of it is not. And we have to kind of like really get down to the science of it. 
And sometimes that theory changes all the time. Like, you just yeah. go over it and it's changing. It's not yeah. like, right. like, the Bible is the same. Right. And that's, I mean, uh, one last thought, you know, before we move on, even like with the theory of evolution, right? It's, it's interesting. In, at a popular level, like pretty much most unbelievers believe in the theory of evolution, right? But at a scientific level, many evolutionary scientists today are actually in crisis. Like, because they, you know, the theory says that there's going to be just this slow evolution over time, and there should be all these transitionary forms. Like, we should find everything from 10% human, 90% ape, to 20% human, 80% ape, 30, 40, we should find 50, 50, we should find something that's 80% human and 20% ape, right? Because it slowly evolved over time, right? But even evolutionists admit we don't, there's like, we should find in the fossil record, we should actually find an even distribution, even, of everything in between. That's just not what we find, right? I mean, they, they think they've, oh, look at this, this is a half ape and whatnot, but that's not what they're finding. They find distinct forms. And so even within the theory of evolution today, they're saying, like, actually, we do believe in evolution, but it didn't happen gradually over time. There was like these cataclysmic events that happened that caused evolution, like to go on for millions of years and then, or billions of years, and then in a million years, all this evolution happened quickly, right? Because that's, that's the theory that they have to come up with to try to justify the evidence. And you're like, huh, you would think maybe you'd question your theory, but they can't question their theory, right? Because ultimately that would involve admitting that there's God. Right. And and that's the, the ultimately and this is to kind of end this discussion. Ultimately, people don't have a scientific problem with God. They have a moral problem with God. Right. And ultimately, the problem is our sin. Right. And even just the blindness of our sin, twisting our reason and trying to find justification for why we don't have to submit to God. And obviously, we know that the Bible teaches that. So, I mean, that once again, that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, that's, that would be a great just discussion, debate, you know, at some point, but, um, yeah, we can move on. Yeah. I just have one quick question. Do you think there's any significance to the fact that Noah cursed Canaan and it wasn't God that cursed Canaan? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Why does Noah curse him rather than God? Um, I don't know, not necessarily. Um, I think, once again, just within the story, we're seeing these key terms keep repeating, blessing and curse. I mean, that, in fact, yeah, anyway, like one of the commentaries I have, it's like blessing and creation. Like, that's such a major theme. We've already seen it in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. And so um, we're really seeing, like, what is blessing? It's God's goodness and God's plan and, and God's going to bless. I mean, we're getting to Genesis 12. God's plan to bless the whole world through the seed of Abraham, right? So we're, we're getting there. But that, I mean, obviously God keeps like kind of defining and investing meaning in these terms as the story unfolds. And what I want you to see here is that it, it's not like these details in the story, they're not incidental. They're not random. You know, they're very purposeful, like which stories Moses chooses to include and how he tells them. Like there's a point to all of this. Like it's all connected. You know, and we have to see what is the author emphasizing? What's he repeating? What are the key words that run throughout the whole Genesis story? Because it's as we notice those that we really see what he's trying to communicate to us. Does that make sense? So like covenant and righteousness and blessing and good and, and God's plan, like these are the terms that's being repeated because that's the message that he's trying to communicate is involving those terms. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. All right. I think we are ready for chapter 10. Okay. Now chapter 10 on its surface, like looks like a what? Another genealogy, but actually it's not. Okay, and this is this is what I love this chapter. I mean, it's just one of the most fascinating chapters in the Bible. Now, notice once again, it starts off with another Toledot, right? And now these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, the sons of Noah, the sons who were born to them after the flood. Okay, so we're starting once again a, a, a new big section. So we keep mentioning there's these five Toledots, you know, before Genesis 12. So here's a new one, new section. Okay, now. I don't know if you got a chance to read this before class or if you've ever read or thought about Genesis 10 before, but let's just contrast just by, even if you're just looking at it quickly, what's the difference between Genesis 10 and Genesis 5? 
So in Genesis 5, it's kind of this genealogy, you know, of, of Adam and whatnot. Uh, but, but what's going on? What, what is this genealogy? What, what is it? Maybe anyone notice any differences? Okay. Yeah, okay, good. So it shows different regions of the earth, different specialties. Yes, absolutely. Good, what else? Yeah, I didn't see anything about the likeness. Yep, yep. Uh, focus on the sun. Say that again. The focus on the sun. I see that at every shot here. I'm not sure if that's different from the Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sons of Japheth, the sons of Gomer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. No, it is. It, it, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. yeah. No account of their deaths. No account of their deaths. Says nations. 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 Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Not their age. Record, what's that? Not their age. Yeah, it's not recording their age. Okay, so... This, were we speaking different languages? Different languages, okay. So if we look at a traditional genealogies, start with one ancestor and follow a line, like their descendant, their descendant, their descendant, their descendant. Are you with me? Okay, that's not what this is at all, is this? This is what we would call a family tree. And it's really the family tree of the whole earth. And as you was said... This is not, it's not just tracing a single line, it's tracing nations, and even what you were saying, uh, DC, like the sons of, like the sons of Israel, like this is nations, this is people groups, this is tracing languages, it's not just like individuals that are being traced here, it's, it's, and it's not just only nations, I mean, it's, you could, it's called the table of nations, maybe in your Bible, you know, but it's, it's tracing ethnicities, it's tracing people groups, it's tracing nations, it's tracing languages, if you will. Oh, this is really interesting, isn't it? And, you, and it's really Ham, Shem, and Japheth, so it's really of the whole world, like all the descendants of Noah, it's tracing their regions, where they are, okay? So in Almost most of your Bibles, actually, in, if, if they have maps, in the back, one of the maps will actually be the table of nations, right? Like mapping this out, and it's showing where all the descendants of Ham and Shem and Japheth ended up, and the people groups, and the regions, and the languages, and the nation. Now, once again, it's, it's not visual. It's in literary form, but, you know, if you were you know, if you were listening carefully to this, you'd be able to like, oh yeah, I mean, this is all, a lot of this geography is foreign to us. So we're like, what is he talking about or whatever? But he, you know, if you were very familiar with this geography, you're like, oh, those people and those people, like, you know, like if we were to do it today, you know, we would use modern nations and modern people groups and whatnot. And we could talk about like in that sense, right? I mean, since Jonathan's in the back, right? Like there would be some nations, but then there would just be people groups like the Hmong people, right? Don't have, they don't have their own nation, but they're still a people group and we know who they are. And we know like, oh, they kind of went over here, but they don't have their own nation or right. But other nations are, you, you tracking with me that, so this is like a family tree. It's a family map of the whole world. Yeah, Stephen. It doesn't necessarily fit with like a, um, because kind of looking ahead to 11, the thing that kind of threw me off is that they have their own languages, mm-hmm. but then 11 we see. Okay, yeah. Well, well, that's what I'm trying to ask is like, yeah. it's not necessarily a uh, chronological. Ad- yes, good. Yes, exactly. So chapter 10 is kind of giving us a map. And I would say it's a, it, you're right. This app happened after chapter 11. Right, so chronologically, but it goes together with chapter 11. Together, these two chapters are showing us the world and how the nation spread, okay? So yeah, you're absolutely right there. But it's interesting, he puts it first because I think he wants to show us, I mean, even that ordering I think is very purposeful, right? He's like, he's giving us a map of the world, okay? And he's showing all the people groups and nations. I mean, coastlands, you can see he's just talking, I mean, just look at the language here, like, the coastlands of the of the nations separated into their lands, language, families, nations, and, and he goes through and and just lists all these people groups and and you know I'm not going to get into all of it. Um, Assyria, all these lands. I mean, there's some really interesting ones in here. Um, according to their families, talking about how they're spreading the Canaanites. You know, um, Shem. Where's oh like. I, I want to get to one kind of random. Where is it? Um, oh, I missed it. Where does it talk about? Um, where does it talk about? 
my brain is blanking. Yep. Oh, no, no, this is the one I wanted to show. All right, look at this. This is kind of the Philistines and the Kasluhim. This gets into, like, I mean, it, I, I did a paper on this once, but, like, the Philistines were actually, like, Greeks that came, and, I mean, just, like, tracing where people groups were. I mean, you could get into, like, world history, right? And it's just fascinating how, like, different people groups for, came from different people, and, like, the Philistines were these sea peoples that actually had a Greek origin, you know, and anyway, I, I, oh, the Kaftorim. Kaftor is ancient Crete, and you get into the whole, I mean, I don't know, this is really geeky stuff, but like, have you ever heard of the Minoan Empire? Like, you know, the Minotaur and all that kind of Greek mythology. Actually, the Crete was like a, settled by some Greek people, and they were on the island of Crete, so they were seafaring peoples, and I believe the Philistines actually came from there, because they were seafaring peoples, and actually you get into like, you look at Goliath, he actually had, like you look at the description of his armor and the weaponry, it's like Greek in nature. And actually, then you do archaeology on the Philistines and their pottery was Greek in nature. And so, but the Bible is actually telling us that stuff. It says they came from Kaftor, which is Crete. And, and even on Kaftor, there's one of the great linguistic mysteries of our age was there was this language there called Linear B. And they didn't, nobody knew what it was. It was just a bunch of symbols. And for many, many years, nobody could decipher it. But then, you know, after a lot of work and they, they figured out it's actually an ancient form of Greek. And that was kind of this big discovery. Anyway, but it's, the reason I bring it up though, is that it's, I mean, the Bible is describing actual reality and where people came from and history. And uh, we'll, we'll get to in a second, like, well, wait a minute, why, why is it doing this? What's this here for? It just uh, made me think, I don't know. So that's where uh, I, I kind of, that's where, like, when they start separating. So everybody know about the, the seed, right, the, the Messiah. I mean, yeah, the seed, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where, when they separate, they start, like, making their culture and their own um, gods. And, mm -hmm. you know, every every nation had, like, the son of God, yeah. Zeus, or thing like that. So kind of made me think like that's where they start because they know but now they do it on their own way yeah they aren't yeah for sure yeah, so I mean, we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. You know, like these are, we call these the nations, the Gentiles. The, and obviously God's going to then out of that call Abram and make a people for himself. Okay, but now let's just step back in the flow of Genesis, in the narrative. What's the point of this chapter? And then, you know, coming into the Tower of Babel. Any guesses or ideas or... Okay, so once again, what's, where are we going with this? We're moving to Genesis 12. Genesis 12, this is the hint, right, is the whole purpose. And what's God's purpose in Genesis 12? Bless the whole world through the seed of Abraham. What is this? The whole world, all the nations. This is the mission field, right, in that sense. This is the people that God wants to save. So in the context, right, God is... And, and there's even, I don't, this is a little bit speculative, so I don't want to get, I don't know if I want to, you know, put too much weight on this, but uh, there was kind of an ancient tradition, like if you count up all the nations here, like there's 70, and then there's a, how many sons of Israel went into Egypt? 70, right? And then there's a verse that says, and th th it's translated two different ways, I don't want to get into it, but in Deuteronomy, that God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel. It's this, that's one way of translating this verse in Deuteronomy. And so it's, I think regardless if that's the right translation of that verse, I think there's this kind of this idea here that like, wow, Israel is supposed to be a light to the nations, right? That's very clear in Genesis, Genesis 12. And so I, I think it probably is purposeful that there's 70 descendants of Israel and 70 nations, right? It's, it's and not like, well, one person for each nation kind of thing, but it's kind of this idea, right? Like you were called to be a light to the nations. You were called to bless the whole world, right? And that was God's purpose for you, right? And we, we know obviously how that gets into the New Testament, First Peter, you are a kingdom priest. You are a chosen nation, like to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, right? So we're, we're made to be ambassadors. We're made to be representatives of God. And I think sometimes, I, I keep saying this, sometimes in the Old Testament, because Israel so failed, right, so miserably, 
it's easy to forget that this was their purpose. It becomes very focused just on them and their sin, right? But, but that was never the design. Like the design was like, like live with God so that the world could be saved, so that you could be a light. And I think that's very clear in Genesis, right? Even just in the flow here, you know, like it's, it's moving towards like the whole world, like God wants to bless the world. That's his plan and he's going to accomplish it. And once again, I'm getting a little of my head of myself, but the Abrahamic covenant, it's a unilateral covenant. In some senses, it's bilateral. We'll talk about that. But in the main, it's a unilateral covenant. Like I am going to bless the world. My plan for the world will not fail, God says, right? He's going to accomplish it. He's going to save the world. We, we know the end of the story. We know Revelation. People from what? Every tongue and tribe and language and nation are worshiping before the throne. That's always been God's plan. And he made that plan clear from Genesis. You with me? Right? So, you know, once again, did they, did they live this out perfectly? No. Did most of them get that? No. But it's clear in Genesis. It's clear in the text. Okay? Questions about that? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of interesting details in the text here of just like historical value. You could, once again, if you have a, you could Google or in the back of your Bible, look up a table of nations and just kind of see how the three brothers, like most of us in this room are either from Ham, Ham or from Japheth. Like very few of us are, f- like unless you're Jewish or Arab, Arabic, you're, you're from, so J- the Jews and the Arabs are from Shem, you know, and then the, for us Gentiles, you know, for, you know, not Semitic peoples, Japheth or Ham, that's, that's the world right there. So any, any questions? I mean, once again, just, we're not going to get into all the different names and peoples and, you know, but the point is like, God, they got spread out. So now you have this mission field that Israel is supposed to reach. Yeah. What's a good uh, reference for a biblical archaeology? Oh, man. Yeah, there's, I have to look up. Um, yeah, there's some great archaeology books. I don't have the titles off the top of my head, but if you email me, I have a couple good um, books. Um, yeah, there's, like, if you, like, yeah, I have a, uh, there's a guy I listen to on YouTube that's really good. I have a friend that's really into archaeology that has a website, and then there's some good books. There's lots of good references. So, I, but I don't know them all off the top of my head. So just email me if you're interested. I can send you links, you know, any of you that want to. All right, anything else? All right. That brings us to chapter 11. Um, and now, of course, we get to the Tower of Babel. <laughs> so um, now it's interesting here that kind of starts off. This is this is this kind of, whenever you see, uh, a sentence start with now, you know, depending on the translation, some of them do that. That's like background information. Um, it's like now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. So that's just kind of telling some background information so that you could understand the rest of the story. Um, hey, going back to you, Stephen, they journeyed which direction? East, right? Uh, so there you go. Uh, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Um, so this is obviously going to become Babel or Babylon, and really becomes kind of um, Shinar is the plain in which Babel sits, and Shinar and Babel and Babylon all throughout the Bible now really become kind of uh, emblematic, I guess you could say, of opposition to God. And, you know, we know even in Revelation, like Babylon the Great and the Great Harlot. And so, you know, once again, kind of going this this theme of like this battle between good and evil and opposition to God and his plan, uh, we know Babel and Babylon plays a huge part in all of that, right? Um, so they go and they, what? They settle there. Um, and they, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly and and they're you know well, let's build ourselves ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth so i mean you could see here what are they what are they doing what did god say to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth it's basically scatter right and they're like nope we don't want to scatter we want to 
make a name for ourselves, build a city for ourselves. Just, I mean, this is just an example of what? Pride. I mean, it's just intense pride, isn't it? And like, why would they want to go to the heavens? Like, that's part of me. Like, are you already trying to be like God? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just the pride, wanting to be like God. And so they build this, um, you know, we would call it like a ziggurat. You ever heard of that? Like this kind of like staircase temple, um, you know, that's, I mean, I don't know if I could draw it, but, you know, it's just like multiple levels, kind of like this, almost like this this tower that they build for themselves. It had like, a they, these were common in the ancient Near East. You know, this was the first one, but then there was many after this. In fact, there was a famous one. Actually, that I just listened to this uh, archaeologist on YouTube that was talking about Babel, that the ancient ziggurat of Babylon was probably built on this same foundation of the Tower of Babel. Um, so ancient Babylon had one of these ziggurats, which was this, uh, you could call it a, a, a temple, a tower temple, right? And so it's kind of this like staircase and at the top was kind of like this idea, like you're communing with the gods and whatnot. Um, but obviously Babel is kind of like the first example. And there's, there's this false religion, obviously, right? This, this like we could commune with the gods um, and almost almost like this idea of like this staircase to heaven, this access to the gods, you know, and just their pride, like we're going to reach all the way to heaven, you know. Um, So once again, we're just seeing, man, we're after the flood, but the problem is still there, right? Just the pride, the hubris to like think that they could be exalted to God. And um, yeah, otherwise we may be scattered, uh, you know, over the whole earth. Well, I love (laughs) in the next verse, well, but before that, this is a great verse. Yahweh came down to see the city. I love it. They're like, we're going to build that tower to heaven. And God's like coming down. Oh, I, I just want to come down and see that little thing that you're making, you know. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's pretty great, you know. Uh, just kind of the literary beauty of it, you know. Um, and, and then, of course, Yahweh says, behold, they have one people. They have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. You know, this is, this is kind of interesting. You know, I think when we think of world peace, you know, like throughout our world, we all think that's like, that's like the goal, right? World peace. But actually, I would say this was world peace. But the problem is it's world peace apart from God. It's the world united against God, right? And actually, I would say in some ways, in the end times, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see world peace united against God, you know? Um, and so that's not a good thing, right? Obviously, what's, what's good is that the world peace that's going to come when Christ returns and the whole world submitted to God. But this is just the world united in their opposition to God, Right? And that's where God says, nothing now that they purpose will be impossible to them. Like, I, I mean, obviously we don't have world peace at all. We have tons of wars and things going on. But I do in some ways kind of think about the modern world in this way, right? Like when the whole world just unites together to advance technology and advance like our human welfare apart from God, right? It's like, man, I mean, it's pretty amazing the technology and, and what, I mean, that's that we we could almost say, wow, like it's true. We see in so many ways, like you know, like if the whole world was united in just kind of bettering the human existence, you know, it's pretty scary in a sense, right? What what we could do, um, just with technology in our minds and whatnot. But it, that's not a good thing, right? Because that's not the goal. The goal is to know and worship God and to live in relationship with Him and to trust Him. And so anyway. Um, but as part of God's plan, he comes down and he confuses their language and he scatters them abroad, you know, over the face of the whole earth. So they stop building this te- the city and it's called Babel. Babel has the idea, like, you know, to, it means what it means in English, right? Blah, 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 you know, babbling. Um, and so, you know, that's because God, that, and that's where language comes from. Now, you know, this is kind of interesting. Another little side note. Um you know, if you like to study languages, which I do, um, it's interesting that we, we talk about like cognate languages. So like English and Spanish or French and Spanish or like a lot of these languages we know actually had a common ancestor language, 
right? Because there's so many commonalities between language, and you can actually track how languages evolve over time. So we know that that happens, right? Linguists can study that, and you could see how even Greek and English are both Indo-European languages, and they share a lot of common grammar and uh, even words and things that over time shifted. But what's interesting is there, so like linguists that don't believe in God, of course, will say, well, all language obviously at one time had a common ancestor and it just evolved over time. But um, what's interesting is the fact that, um, you know, between Greek and English and a lot of these cognate languages, you can see and you could trace it to a common language. But between Chinese and English, there are no cognates. Between Hebrew and English and Hebrew and Chinese, there are no cognates, none, right? They're like totally different language families. And so I would suggest like, yeah, there are like a lot of languages on the earth that did kind of like evolve and transition. But at the Tower of Babel, there were some fundamental, I mean, I, I, I haven't, some languages I know a little bit about, but like I would say probably even like the Native American languages, right? There, there's no, it, they were similar to each other, but th there are no similarity between that and Chinese or, and I can't speak authoritative to all the different language families on the earth, but it seems from what I've studied that there was some core language families, you know, that God created that, that, that happened at Babel, you could say, and that other languages then kind of spread out from there and evolved and changed over time. So, I mean, this really does describe the world that we live in. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to get too much into that, but I, I do think that's kind of an interesting, you know, like, yeah, we have language. And, and I think, once again, if we believe the Bible is actual history, like what we see in the world, like we shouldn't see, right, that all languages evolve from a common ancestor. If we saw that English, like all the languages of the world were like English and Spanish and French and Greek and like some of these kind of cognate languages, it would really qua cause us to question the biblical account and be like, wait a minute, we could s tell scientifically all languages had a common ancestor, but that's actually not what we find, you know? And so it's like, that's encouraging, right? It's like, that's what God says, you know? And so anyway, um, yeah. Any, any questions about the Tower of Babel? Questions. So at one time, was there this one language before the, the yes, Tower? Yes, exactly. And that's how the whole chapter started out. Now, the whole world had one language. Yeah, so there was a common language prior to the Tower of Babel. And people have, I mean, it gets into interesting questions like, well, what language was it? And, you know, because obviously the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, right? And so you know, when, was it Hebrew? And, and I don't necessarily think so. I have, I have one professor who thinks so, but um, I don't necessarily think so. Um, and the reason that's interesting, though, is because then the, the talking and the speech that we see recorded in Genesis prior to this, it wasn't in Hebrew, right? It was in some other, whatever that one language was, they were talking in this other language. Yeah. So the statement there where he says that then nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Is that just indicating God saying like, because they're unified in language, they can continue on in worse sin, worse opposition? Yeah, I think so. It's like kind of, this is like God's trying to oppose this world peace with the world united against him just, you know, going on. And so he, he stops that, he intervenes in that and d breaks them up and there ends up kind of like they're not just working on this common goal together right and that and now we have different nations and peoples and that's part of god's design like and there's there's obviously warring and different factions and whatnot and um as opposed to just the world united against god and so that's why i was saying like yeah we don't have that like obviously <laughs> russia's at war and i mean the old i mean now we got the middle east crisis flaring up again and so um but you do see a little taste of that of like man when like so many people are just working together on technology and this like how far we could advance you know and there's a sense of that that oh yeah technology i'm not saying technology is evil but there's a sense of that that's not good right because it's united against god you know um yeah yeah does it have any relation with uh, speaking in tongues in Acts? Yeah, absolutely. So in Acts, you know, you, with the speaking in tongues, you do have somewhat of an undoing of, the, of Babel, right? And I would say 
in the end, you know, there is going to be unified speech, you know, so in the kingdom. So you have a taste of the kingdom in Acts, right? That, that language barrier and the division, you know, of the world into nations and ethnicities. It's not that we're going to lose our distinctiveness. And like, obviously the diversity is good, but there is going to be an, in the end, there's going to be an undoing of Babel and a unity once again, but a unity under God. So like in the kingdom of God, we're not going to be like, I can't communicate with you, you know, like, because we speak different languages. We're too different. No, we're going to be, once again, the world will then finally be united as it was intended to be. Yeah, so that's good. Good. All right, so now we're coming to the end of chapter 11. Um, So this is, these are the generations, the records of the generations of Shem, And so now we're tracing basically another genealogy, and this is tracing from Shem to all the way down, all the way down, Terah, right? And Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, right? And so now these are the the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of the father, Terah, in the land of his birth, in Ur the Chaldeans, Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. Abram's wife was Sarah. Nahor's wife was Milcah, right? And so this is now we're really kind of, this section here is really preparing us for chapter 12. So we're kind of in the hinge here. There's the hinge is not always like in between two verses. Sometimes a whole section can kind of be the hinge. Does that make sense? And so we're now really moving to Abraham. And now we have the genealogy that gets us to him. And he's going to be, Once again, the chosen line through which God is going to accomplish this plan and promise to bless the world. Okay, so um, a couple things here. I should have I should have put a map um, on on my slides here. I didn't I didn't I failed to do that. But if you look at your map and you could I don't know, maybe you have a map in the back of your Bibles or whatnot, but you'll see. Does everyone know what the Fertile Crescent is? Have you ever heard of that? Right. So the Fertile Crescent is this idea that, you know, you got the, the Persian Gulf and, and Ur is really, you know, you think of modern day. I, I don't know if I should pull up a map. I, it won't show on here. Right. So, um, you know, you got this Fertile Crescent, you got desert in between. So if you're going to go from, you know, um, the Persian Gulf to Israel, you don't go a straight line. That's going straight through desert. But you got the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. You kind of go up and around. Okay, because that part is where the rivers are, so that part is fertile and whatnot. Okay, you tracking with me? And so what actually happens here is, is you see kind of like them starting to make the way to the land of Israel. So, um, so like you could see here, these are the generations of Terah. Um, Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur. So that's like all the way in the east. That's where they started. But they take for themselves wives, and they go from Ur towards the land of Canaan, right? In order to enter the land of Canaan, they went as far as Haran, and Haran, they settled there. So Haran is halfway, basically, between Ur and the land of Canaan. Are you tracking with me? Sorry, if you could pull up your phone and pull up a map, maybe. Okay? And I guess why this is interesting is, who's going to... So Abraham and Lot are going to continue from Haran into the land of Canaan, but um, who's going to stay behind? Um, Nahor, right? And so when Isaac and Jacob, they go for their wives, they don't go all the way back to Ur, they go back to um, Haran. Anyway, so they're kind of like halfway there, so to speak. So um, once again, not all of the Bible is in perfect chronological order. This is like, so I don't know, like with Genesis 12, if it is in perfect chronological order, because obviously at this point you could see, sorry, I pull up my pen here, um, that they're, they're setting off from Ur, what, in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they go as far as Haran and settled there. So it seems like they've they've already received the call from God to leave their homeland and to go to Canaan, but it kind of goes in stages, right? And so more of the family goes and makes it halfway to Haran, and then Abraham and Lot are going to go the full way all the way to Canaan. Okay, you, you kind of tracking with me there? Um, and that, that just becomes significant in the rest of the story why, 
you know, like, because, man, the, the journey from Ur to Canaan is, is massive, thousands of miles over through this fertile crescent. And so when they go to get wives, they only kind of have to go halfway or a third of the way to go back um, to Haran. Um, anyway, does that, does that make sense? So this is kind of a transitionary section as we're showing, like, the, the line is narrowing down now. And from now on, in the book of Genesis, we're going to narrow in on Abraham and his line. So once again, all of Genesis up to this point has been very global, right? I mean, the flood, the whole world gets wiped out. The Tower of Babel, the whole world was united and gets scattered. The table of nation, I mean, the fall affects the whole world. And so everything has been very global and just like the spread of sin and death on the whole earth. And now we're going to suddenly narrow in and focus on this one family. And that once again, kind of going back to Noah, it's the same paradigm, right? God chooses one man, one family, one line that he's going to call to himself, who's going to walk in right relationship with him, is going to be the means that God's going to use to, to bless the world, to reach others, to save the world ultimately. Okay, you, you tracking with me? Okay, so I want to, um, let me see if I could do this here. Is this doing what I want to do? No. That's not it. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to. Oh, I know what I want to do. Is that it? All right. And then I want to make it full screen. All right. So I'm going to try to draw, ta- you know, kind of do a little illustration here. Um, I want to talk about just like the covenants. And we're going to, this is what we're going to talk about probably for the rest of the class. So we've been introduced to this idea of a covenant. Uh, in this class. And so, yeah, we really want to kind of narrow in on what are we talking about when we're talking about a covenant. So once again, a covenant is, you know, in the main, like this bilateral agreement, right? It's a relationship between two people, right? And both, like, so, you know, up here you have God, and then up here you have, you know, whether it's Noah or, you know, Abraham or whatever. And, and like God makes some promises and you make some promises and both are required to do their part, right? That's what we're talking about a covenant is, right? We see that in the, the covenant that God made with Noah. But as we're, we're getting in, we're about to be introduced here to the Abrahamic covenant. So I just want to talk about, you know, we'll talk about it next week. But if you go to Genesis chapter 12, what we're going to find is it's God says, I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing through you. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And this is really, I'm kind of previewing next class for us because I, I just want to, you know, there's so much in the next class. I really want us to kind of come into it with this understanding of what a covenant is. So the covenant that God makes with Abraham, we're going to find out next week is a unilateral covenant. Okay. In other words, it's a one-sided covenant. It's God's unconditional promise to Abraham to use him to bless the world. So in that sense, we could just say the Abrahamic covenant, it's God's plan to bless the world. Okay. And we know God's going to keep his plan, right? Uh, We know that he is going to, he's not going to fail. He's going to do it. And so I would like to illustrate that as like this, you know, this one way arrow, right? It's God's plan to bless the world. God makes this promise, like, I'm going to do this. And, you know, we know that that is going to go through the cross. Like, that's all of his plan for all of history. But what we're going to find out is that God also wants us to be part of his plan. And so the way I like to illustrate this is like this. God is going to bless the whole world. It's his plan. Like, he created the world. He created for a purpose. The question is, are you going to be part of that plan, right? And so what we're going to, this is, so, you know, I'm going to get, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but um, it's all good. Um, So if we put up here the Abrahamic covenant, it's not, it's not writing up here for some reason. Um, Anyway, that's supposed to say the Abrahamic covenant. And then down here, it's the Mosaic covenant. I don't know. My pen is not working for some reason now. Um, oh, it's my, I don't know. Let me try again. <laughs> I, th- I thought I had this all worked out. I know. I'm trying to 
trying to get all fancy with digital technology. Um, anyway, it is not writing. <laughs> it doesn't work. Oh, man, I'll have to fix that later. Um, but in any case, the idea here is like this vertical arrow is the Mosaic Covenant. Right, like so, it's as you actually keep right covenant with God, you're part of God's plan to bless the world. And that's once again, that's what we saw with Noah. Right, like God was going to save the world; He wanted to save the world. Obviously, His plan was not to wipe out the earth with the flood and leave nobody left and fail at His plan. Right, it's as Noah walked in right relationship with God that He was the means of God accomplishing His plan to save the world, and so you know, this is going to be really understanding how these covenants relate to each other is going to be understanding how the storyline of the Bible works out. And simply put, it's, it's as you're faithful to me, you'll be part of my plan to bless the world. Now we know Israel often didn't keep their side of the covenant, right? And they, for example, the first generation of Israelites, right? That's who, that's the, the parents of the people that this book is written to, Right. Right? They died in the wilderness. They didn't get to go into the promised land. They didn't advance the plan right? in that sense. They weren't part of it. Right? And so as Moses is writing to the second generation, what he's basically saying is God is going to accomplish his plan whether you die in the wilderness or not. Right? Like You don't have to be part of it, but if you live in right relationship with me, right, you'll be part of the plan. Okay, so do you, I want you to kind of understand the nature of this. Like on the one hand, there's unconditional promises. God is going to accomplish his plan. And he's, if, he, if he uses you or not, he's going to do it. But the question is like, are you going to be part of that? Are you going to be faithful? And as we're going to see as we get into the Genesis narrative, right? God chooses to use Abraham, right? God chooses to use Isaac as part of that plan. What's really interesting is when God chooses to use Jacob, right? Because Jacob is a deceiver. He's not faithful, right? So, but, but God chose him. So what does God have to do? God has to transform him. And so one of the lessons that we're going to see here, it's even going to point to the need for the new covenant. God's going to accomplish his plan. Like just take these two premises. God is going to bless the world no matter what. Okay. You got that? God is going to bless the world no matter what. We know that that's his plan. Okay. That's premise number one. Here's premise number two. God is going to use people to do that, okay? Here's premise number three. He can only use people that are in right relationship with him. What does that guarantee? That one day he's going to transform people's hearts to be in right relationship with him, to be able to use them to bless the world. And that's actually, Deuteronomy is going to talk about that. So that's, it's going to give us a, a, a preview, if you will, or the new covenant in kernel form, like, Moses is going to tell the second generation of Israelites, hey, I'm telling you all this. I'm telling you how to live with me, but I know your hearts aren't there. And so God actually promises in Deuteronomy, one day I'm going to circumcise your hearts. Because be, why? He has to because he's going to bless the world and he's going to do it through people walking in right relationship with him. Okay, And, and I bring this up because really this whole story of Noah that was kind of the, the centerpiece of our lesson for today, really it highlights that. Don't, don't you see that? Right, God's going to save the world. Right? He's not going to just wipe everyone out and not have a plan going forward. But what? He had to use, Moses was part of that plan. And as Moses walked in faithfulness to him, he was part of the plan and he was used to save the world. And that, that is really the lesson for us, right? Once again, to this second generation of Israelites, man, if you walk with me, if you walk in right relationship with me, I'm going to use you to bless the world, right? But once again, like if you're not faithful to me, you won't be part of the plan, but that you're not going to make the plan fail right? But it's an encouragement to us. Like, this is what we've been created for. This is our identity. We've been made in the image of God. We've been made to have a relationship with him, to walk with him so that God would use us to accomplish his purpose, which ultimately is to save the world. Okay. So once again, I think this is all clear in Genesis, right? It's not all laid out. I mean, I, mean, I should say the, the Torah as a whole, you know, it's not all laid out in explicit form, but hopefully you could see even from Genesis 1 through 11 and into 12 here, you could see like this plan spiraling into death and yet God's advancing his plan through people that walk faithful to him. Like, and you could see ultimately Genesis 12, 
God's like, you, Abraham, I'm choosing you. I'm going to use you, right? As you walk faithfully with me, you walk by faith, you trust me. I'm going to use you to bless the whole world, okay? So anyway, this is a class of Old Testament survey. We're going to survey the whole Old Testament, understanding the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the New Covenant, and the Davidic Covenant, those four covenants are the storyline of the Bible. Because, because really, God's plan is all about his promises and his plan, right, of what he's going to do, and yet how we could be part of that. Um, so I'll, I'll unpack that more, and I'll even try to draw it once I get this thing to draw properly. But um, anyway, does, does that make sense? Just kind of the basic nature of, of these covenants here. All right, any, any questions or comments as we... Um, there we go. Yeah. Do you, you wouldn't call God's relationship with Adam the covenant, right? Or... Um, I, so that's a great question. So Jonathan's bringing out, like, there's different systems of theology. One is called covenant theology. And one's called dispensational theology. And covenant theology Said, you know, sounds like it'd be more about the covenants, but all the covenants in covenant theology are not the four covenants that are emphasized in the Bible. The four covenants that are l- emphasized and repeated and talked about in the Bible are, once again, I mean, the Noahic covenant is there, but Abrahamic covenant, Davidic covenant, New Covenant, Mosaic covenant are mentioned and talked about and explained all throughout the Bible. And ironically, it's the dispensational system that talks about those four covenants a lot. The covenant theology talks about this covenant of works with Adam. Well, I I think there are kind of hints of a covenant with Adam. Like, obviously, God gave Adam commands, and obviously, God, you know, Adam broke the commands and whatnot, but there's none of that covenant language with Adam, right? So, I mean, theologically, was there a covenant with Adam? Maybe, but that's not how the storyline, what the storyline of the Bible emphasizes, if you will, right? I mean, I think there's, there's a picture of that there, Um, but the storyline of the Bible, once again, is just all about these four covenants over and over again. The Psalms, the prophets, they're constantly going back to the promise God made with Abraham, the promise that God made with David, the, and we're going to talk about those just in the Torah, you know, the, the, the Mosaic covenant, their need to be in right relationship with God and the new covenant. Those are the four covenants that the old Testament and the prophets are constantly coming back to and talking about because those are the main covenants that kind of like unfold God's story. So once again, covenant theology talks about the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and all these other kind of like covenants, which, I mean, there's some truth in that, but it's just not what the Bible's emphasizing. Yeah. I have a super weird question. Um, So you know how Adam is in in the New Testament, or I think it's the New Testament, Adam is described as being the son of God. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed you were talking about these prophecies that, that Noah was the first one to prophesy over his son, Abraham yeah. prophesies over his son. I've noticed that in the Old Testament, the first son, it was always the second son <laughs> yes. who got the blessing. Because yeah. the first son is always the one who fails, and then the second yeah. son is the one who obeys. And just like Adam was God's first son who failed, Christ is God's Mm-hmm. Son, ultimate, you know, yeah. yeah, there's going to be a lot of, yeah, I mean, a lot of the seeds that are starting to be planted here, right? This theology is going to keep developing over time. We're going to see it unfold until we, yeah, we get to that full culmination in Christ. Absolutely. You know, and uh, that's going to be an emphasis we're going to see a lot, especially in this whole next section here in 12 through 50, right? That God chooses the younger son. Like this, the first son is the son that was supposed to receive the inheritance, right? The son that, and it's, it's really that, I mean, to you quote Corinthians, God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong, right? And, and really, you know, in not so explicit language, Genesis is going to show us God's election, God's choice, right? I, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Um, when we think of election, we get caught up in like, well, God's will versus our will and all these kind of debates. But really, whenever election is mentioned in the Bible, pretty much exclusively, it's there to emphasize grace, right? Like God is choosing the weak thing. Like God, like, because if God's not intervening, we know where this world is going, 
right? I mean, we just, we just saw the story. So, you know, like if he just left Abraham to his own way, Abram, right? You know, we know where the world is going. It's just repeating the story over and over, but God is intervening. God is choosing. He's, he's rescuing people out of the world to be in relationship with him. And so really election is God's grace, right? And so same thing with Noah, same thing with, oh, you want to hit that light, Noemi? Oh, it's on a sensor. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> So, so when, you know, we are talking, I mean, Genesis emphasizes election. God chose Jacob, God chose Isaac, God chose Abraham, but it's always to emphasize like his grace, like he's rescuing, he's showing grace, he's calling people. And even then, it's not just for them, he's choosing people to use to be in right relationship with him to bless the whole world. So it's always, it, grace is never meant, like salvation is never meant to be just end with us right? God, why does God save us? It's the same thing. Not just so that we could live this nice, happy life here on earth and go to heaven, right? It's, it's to be a light, to be as representatives, to be as ambassadors. Yeah, good. So where does it enter the, like, the question of what is the purpose of man? Mm-hmm. Like man was created for, to worship God, to yeah. honor him, and to glorify him? Yeah. So, I mean, Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. You know, I would say even from Genesis here, we get, I mean, that full answer, God was made to worship God and enjoy God forever. You know, obviously, you know, the, that explicit language, you know, we'll see that tomorrow in second Corinthians in some ways, you know, Um, but the new Testament really unpacks that, but we're seeing the foundation of it here, aren't we? Obviously it doesn't come out and say that, But in Genesis chapter 1, we were created to know God. We were created to be in relationship with him. We were created to enjoy him. We were created to rule for him over the earth and to represent him. So to know God and enjoy him forever. I mean, I think you could could see that even right here in Genesis, can't we? We were made to walk with God, right? We were made to know him. We were made to enjoy him. Um, Now, once again, uh, that once again, that's this idea of progressive revelation, we're seeing the principles here, but we're seeing them in kernel form. We're seeing them kind of in um, not fully explicit, not unpacked all the way, but it's there, right? You could see it here in Genesis, right? Now it's not as explicit. And, and as the story keeps unfolding, there, we just keep building on these truths and kind of like unpacking them and explaining them as the Old Testament unfolds. But I want you to see, I'm not making this up. I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not like reading the New Testament into it. It's here. And then the, the, it just, as we keep going, it keeps unfolding until we get to the full expression in the New Testament. Does that make sense? So it's, it's not like there was nothing. And then all of a sudden the New Testament came and gave us light and we could see what we couldn't see. It's just, no, we, we, it was here, but it just needed to be further unpacked. Yeah, good. Other questions or comments? All right, so that's, I mean, that's this whole section, right? This downward spiral of sin and death. But once again, it's not without hope. And God's choosing individuals to walk with him and be in right relationship with him because God's plan is always to bless the world and to save the world. And ultimately, you know, that's going to be through the Abrahamic covenant that we're going to hit in full next week. So, um, yeah, just so beautiful as we kind of see God's plan unfold. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Once again, always check the schedule. You know, um, there's a couple of weeks that we, yeah, it's not always, you know, what would be expected. So. Are right, any final questions or comments? All right, appreciate you all. Have a great week.